Thank you, David. So the sutta is advice from Nandaka, Majjhima Nikaya 146. This sutra is about seeing the truth of feeling and craving. Where are these coming from in discussion? You know, the format itself is a discussion manner, and it is pretty rare to see this format, this kind of format in uh, Tipitaka, right? There's a story behind it. So this type of uh, format is very suitable for people with the analytical mind. Okay. So this um, uh, Bhikkhu, Nandaka, it's uh, uh, actually he's a Maha Nandaka, and um, you know this Bande um, mentioned it at one point. You know, in Buddha time, there's about eighty Maha, the uh, foremost in something, right? So this Bhikkhu Nandaka is foremost in um, talking to the Dharma and do the bhikkhunis and bhikkhunis are liberated because of this particular talks. So he took us a details in dependency on six sense bases, internal and external, and how that leads to consciousness and then to feelings and uh, our craving. So this is this is this all about. Um, so here we go. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, Blessed One was living as Savati in Jetta Grove, Anitta Bindika Park. Then Mahapachapati Gautami, together with 500 bhikkhunis, went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to the Blessed One, she stood at the side and said to him, Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One advise the bhikkhunis. Let the Blessed One instruct the bhikkhunis. Let the Blessed One give the bhikkhunis a talk on Dhamma. Now on that occasion, elder bhikkhus, are, sorry, elder bhikkhus were taking turns in advising the bhikkhunis. But Venerable Nandaka did not want to advise them when his time comes. Then the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Ananda. Ananda, who turn is this today to advise Bhikkhuni? Venerable Sir, it is Venerable Nandaka turn to advise the Bhikkhuni, but he does not want to advise them even though it is his turn. Then Blessed One addressed the Venerable Nandaka, advise the Bhikkhuni Nandaka, instruct the Bhikkhuni Nandaka, give the Bhikkhuni a talk on the Dharma Brahman. So there's a backstory about the whole thing. So first of all, uh, Maha, Mahapajapati Gaudami is a Buddha's maternal aunt. So Buddha mother was uh, passed away uh, about Buddha when about seven seven days old, so she took him, you know, Buddha in and raised it with uh, two of his children, both called Nanda. So yeah, like that's a, a very interesting story stories about them as well. But anyway, and um, so when become, you know, like uh, uh, everybody become bhikkhus, you know, all these, um, all these Sakyans, um, the Buddha's clan, um, you know, all the cousins become uh, monks. And a lot of these women wants to do the same thing. So leading by the Mahapajapati Gaudami, they go and ask Buddha for uh, a permission to become a bhikkhunis. And, you know, there's a, we don't know, really unknown um, facts. He refused it about two times. But on the third time, Ananda intervened, and then they all become bhikkhunis. So bhikkhuni sasana was uh, established. And bhikkhuni, 
good up, but you know, I think it's like a lot of tax say he did this on on purpose so that Bikunis would take seriously about what his teachings, right? And those are like including his um, cousins and sisters and you know. So anyway, um, in this occasion, though. Ma, um, the monk Nandaka doesn't want to go and teach the bhikkhunis. So everybody else is teaching the bhikkhunis. He doesn't want to because he is the one of these uh, uh, super psychic ability that he can see his past life. And these bhikkhunis, 500 of bhikkhunis, were his you know, wives in a previous <laughs> lifetime. So he's embarrassed that um, some other bhikkhus might be thinking and saying, you know, Nandaka is stay involving with them. So he doesn't want to. That's why he's just avoiding. So, but uh, Buddha knew he is the only one can do the talk and he, Buddha sees that many, many, many bhikkhunis will liberate from it. So <coughs> Buddha pushed him. So that's the back story. <clears throat> yes, Venerable Sir. The Venerable Nandaka replied, Then in the morning, the Venerable Nandaka dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into the Savati for alms. When he had wandered for alms in Savati and had returned from his alms round after his meal, he went with companion to the Rajaka Park. Bhikkhuni saw the Venerable Nandaka coming from a distance and prepare a seat and set out a water for the feet. So that's a very tradition in Asia. I don't know, right? Like, is this, what do you mean by set out water for a feet? You know, you will see that a lot when you're reading. So, you know, because bhikkhus are like going barefoot everywhere. So they're going to go into a, anybody, not just the bhikkhu, you know, like to house. And it's always, there's a bowl of water to wash their feet. That's what it is. Venerable Nandaka sat down on the seat made ready and washed his feet. The bhikkhunis paid homage to him and sat down on one side. When they were seated, Venerable Nandaka told the bhikkhunis, Sisters, this talk will be in the form of questions. When you understand, you should say, we understand. When you do not understand, you should say, we do not understand. When you are doubtful or perplexed, you should ask me, how is this venerable sir? What is this mean of what is the meaning of this? Venerable sir, we are satisfied and pleased with the Master Nandaka in sorry, we are satisfied and pleased with the Master Nandaka in that he invite us even with this much. So that time is like even in a bhikkhu to, you know, like Buddha to, to bhikkhu, it's quite rare that questions and answer format. So bhikkhunis are already excited and, you know, like open the mind, happiness. You see the gladness comes in and open their heart. Sister, what do you think? Is the eye permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir. In what is impermanent, suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir, is what is impermanent, suffering and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Venerable Sir. Oh, you gotta say like, oh, this is an easy question, right? Like, I mean, yeah, for, for us, it's like we're learning, right? Like we have these discos after discos. You have to take your back to these, you know, 2,500, 2,600 years ago. We don't have internet. We don't have YouTube, right? It's just like this is probably the very first time they are hearing this. So, you know, you can um, assume that they do have the, some meditation practice already. Yeah. Sisters, what do you think? 
is the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Venerable Sir. Why is that? Because, Venerable Sir, we have already seen this as well as actually is with proper wisdom thus. These six internal bases are impermanent. Good, good sister. So it is with noble disciple to see this is actual is actual is with proper wisdom. Proper wisdom, every time you hear the wisdom here, they see the links, they realize the links of dependent origination. That's what this means. Okay. So that's about the internal, you know, it's from our own body's uh, internal basis. Sister, what do you think? Our forms sounds, order, flavor, tangible, mind objects, permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Venerable Sir. Why is that? Because, Venerable Sir, we have already seen this as well as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. These six external bases are impermanent. So this is about outside. That's including your thoughts. Think about that, okay? Yeah, like sometimes, how many times we take the thought, it is just the thought to become the thought in this is mine and, you know, Papancha started, right? So that's what this is all about. Good, good sister. So it is with noble disciple who see this as actual is with proper wisdom. Now here he's talk about, um, you know, the six external bases. Now he would talk about consciousness, okay? Sister, what do you think? Is eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, mind consciousness, permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change? fit to be regarded thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Venerable Sir, why is that? Because, Venerable Sir, we have already seen this well as actually is with proper wisdom thus. The six classes of consciousness are impermanence. Right? So you saw it in the uh, pictures, um, six in internal and external <coughs> Meet consciousness happen, right? Good, good sister. So it is with noble disciple who see this is actually is proper wisdom. Here's other series of great similes coming up. So, sister, suppose an oil lamp is bunny. The oil is impermanent and subject to change. The wick is impermanent and subject to change. The flame is impermanent and subject to change, and its radiance is impermanent and subject to change. Now, would anyone be speaking rightly who spoke thus? While this oil lamp is burning, the oil wicks and the flame are impermanent and subject to change, but its radiance is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. No, Venerable Sir, why is that? Because, Venerable Sir, while that oil lamp is burning, 
the oil, wicks, the flame are impermanent and subject to change. So its radiant must be impermanence and subject to change. So too, sister, anyone be speaking rightly who spoke thus. The six internal bases are impermanent and subject to change, but the pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant feeling that one experience depends upon these six internal bases is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. Right? No venerable sir. Why is that? Because each feelings or experience arise in dependent upon corresponding condition. And with the cessations of this corresponding condition, the feeling cease. Good, good sister. So it is with noble disciple who see this is this as it's actually with its proper wisdom. So we learn our dependent origination. Um, I'm going to code it a little bit again so that I refresh your memory from this is Majjhima Nikaya 38 and paragraph 17. So Bhikkhu, with ignorance as condition, volition come to be. The volition is a condition, consciousness, consciousness as <laughs> condition, mentality, materiality. With mentality, materiality as condition, six four basics. Six four basis a condition, contact. With the contact as condition, feeling. Feeling as condition, craving. Craving as condition, clinging. With clinging as condition, being or habitual tendency. With the being as condition, birth. Birth as condition, aging and death. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair come to be. Such is the ori origin of the whole mess of suffering. So, I will re go back to the uh, original sutta. Sisters, suppose a great tree is standing, poses of heartwood. Its root is impermanence and subject to change. Its trunk is impermanence and subject to change. Its branches and foliage are impermanence and subject to change. And its shadow is impermanence as subject to change. Now, would anyone be speaking rightly who spoke thus? The root, trunk, branches, foliage, in this great tree, standing poses the hardwood are impermanence and subject to change. But its shadow is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. No, Venerable Sir, why is that? Because, Venerable Sir, the root, the trunk, the branches, the foliage of this great tree standing possesses of hardwood are impermanent and subject to change. So its shadow must be impermanent and subject to change. So too, sister, would anyone be speaking rightly who spoke thus? These six external bases are impermanent and subject to change, but the pleasant, painful, neither pleasant nor painful feeling that one experiences in dependence upon these six external bases is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. No, Venerable Sir, why is that? Because each feeling arises in dependent upon its corresponding condition. And with the cessations of the corresponding condition, the feeling ceases. Good, good sister. So it is a noble disciple who see this as actually is proper wisdom. So, you know, we talked a lot about the eyes and forms meeting, but I just wanted to give you a, um, some examples of a, you know, smell, right? When your nose and smell of a jasmine, what happened? Oh, pleasant experience. That's the Vedana. That's the feeling, right? Pleasant feeling. Then, 
oh I want it I might pluck it something like that will happen you see that you know link we talked about it's how is that go down and on the painful side just like my example yesterday when I saw car cut off right what happened unpleasant you know our, our feeling happened this is bad you know how dare you right and then um, go on and go forth everything arises so you have to pay attention to external internal what arose the feeling and in the dependent originations link what comes after the feeling craving right so this is the next one next sections are about that sisters suppose a, a little bit hard to um, listen as a Buddhist though but bear with me sister suppose a skilled butcher on his apprentice or, or his apprentice will kill a cow and curve it up with a sharp, sharp butcher's knife without damaging the inner mess of flesh without and without damaging the outer hide he will cut server and curve away the inner tenon sinews ligaments with the sharp butcher's knife then having cut sir sivers and curved all the all cuff all this away he would remove the outside height and cover the cow again with the same height would he be speaking rightly if he were to say this cow is joined to his high just as it was before. No, venerable sir. Why is that? Because if the skilled butcher or his apprentice will kill a cow and curd and curve all the way, even though he cover the cow again with the same hide and say this cow is joined to the hide, just as it was before, that cow will stay be disjoint from the hide. You see that? Like, right? Like, it's just, you know, everything, all the things that attach to external and internal were cut off by a knife. Okay? That's the example. Sister, I have given the simile in order to convey a meaning. This is the meaning. The inner mass of flesh is terms of six internal bases. The outer height is the term for the six external bases. The inner tendon, sinew, and ligament in the terms for delight and lust. The sharp butcher knife is the term for noble wisdom. The noble wisdom that cut severe and curves away the inner defilement, fetter, and bond. So, what did we cut the, you know, um, craving with the wisdom? So that's the whole six R, isn't it? Recognizing the peace that craving is arise, you know, and, and go through the whole six R process. So that's the wisdom piece, okay? Sisters, there are seven enlightenment factors through the development and cultivations of which Bhikkhu by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. Here and now enter upon and abides in deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with destructions of taint. What are the seven? Here, sister, Bhikkhu developed the mindfulness enlightenment factor which is supported by seclusion dispassions and cessation and ribbon and relinquishment he develops the investigations of states enlightenment factors all the way to so okay so let me go one by one mindfulness enlightenment factors supported by seclusion dispassions Sounds like a going through the jhana, right? It's just like you develop the mindfulness, um, you know, first jhana, seclusions, dispassions, and cessations is like 
it's, it's not talking about the whole uh, cessations of consciousness. This is talking about cessations of uh, sensual pleasure outside. That's right. So the second one is he developed the investigation, investigations of states enlightenment factors. So second factor investigations. The energy enlightenment factors. The third is the energy. The rapture enlightenment factors. Fourth, the tranquility enlightenment factor. Fifth, the concentration or collectedness enlightenment factors. And the equanimity enlightenment factors, which are supported by seclusion, dispassions, and cessation ripping in the relinquishment. So when, when we practice the uh, jhanas practice, the, the way that you know uh, we were reading from um, MN 111, for example, right? So those are the state you establish the mindfulness, and then you have the, some wisdom part to it, and you you know adjust your energies. And then what happened? Joy arise. And then joys lead to tranquility. Tranquility lead to collectedness. Collectedness lead to equanimity. That is a seven enlightenment factor. Because like I'm emphasizing, I will a little bit emphasize more um, uh, about this because it's very useful for our meditation practice. Okay, but let me read some more. Some more. There are seven enlightenment factors through the development and cultivations of which Bhikkhu, by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, here and now, enter upon abides in deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destructions of the taint. So we learned that yesterday too, right? Like it says to be fully um, liberated. These factors are intertwined uh, in the Upanishad Sutta, right? And uh, let me, you know, go into a little bit more detail, just a tiny bit more detail about each and individual factors. <coughs> mindfulness. What is mindfulness? You know, we talked about this, you know, um, remembering how, you know, remembering to observe how my attention move from one to the other, right? And Mindfulness has a very interesting properties, I would say, I experienced this one by myself, is it's like a guard for our mind. You know, it's act like a guard. If you are mindful, you can't have this unwholesome mindset can comes in and play. Think, you know, try that. You know, the day that you are angry, bring your mindfulness in. I'm angry, that anger is gone. Mindfulness is a very interesting, you know, um, uh, our properties of mind, the factors of mind. And, and in the seven enlightenment factors, I'll a little bit talk about how we balance in the um, meditations as well. But mindfulness factor is the anchor. Of all okay and another thing is like very close association with wisdom so another one is investigation factors of Dharma another very significant factors like it's a bit of analytical part to it but it's not like a you know you try you know, trying to go down to that, oh, what if, what if, what if, just a tiny bit. This is where, oh, th I am mindful, or I am, this is a wholesome thought, and this is not a wholesome thought. This is a, you know, so that is uh, Dhamma, Vij Dhamma Vijaya um, factors, investigations of Dhamma factors. This one is very useful to bring up, especially when you are sleepy. Remember wait, W-A-I-T, what am I thinking? Directly grab the factors, okay? So that is not just on a meditation, it's even in the outside, right? So I think they feed to each other. 
The third one is energy. This is this factor support the mindfulness. Without the energy, what happened? Mindfulness run away. You know, so you gotta. It's this is this is the part that you do the dialing. You know, how much energy you want to put into your meditation? How little? The energy factor is the one that you you have to, you know, uh, uh, see. If it is too much, you know, uh, you go into the restlessness. If it is too little, go into the sleep. You know, slop and topper. So, this this is the factors. And the next one is rapture. Some of us best friend. So rapture PT is very noticeable. Um, this is where you know uh, uh, you can your body can feel it. Like it's these these are like you know I I read somewhere, um, a, you know this is about five types of PTs. You know like your bodily like sometimes heat comes up, right? Or sometimes like the joy accompanied with the intense energy comes up, like it's like a wave hitting you, or sometimes tingling comes up. Oh, but if you are in a our jhana practice, these uh, jhana practice you do properly, then just you know, really uplifting happiness comes up, right? And that can sustain for quite a long time. That's PT. The people with the PT, you can tell from miles away, they are smiling and like they are very uplifting. Tranquility. And I think I think I talked a little bit about tranquility yesterday as well. It's like a, you know, very serene. And still, this one you can feel it on your body as well. You know, um, in the beginning days, I feel like you know my body is like when uh, tranquility comes in, like it's cool to touch. Why am I saying these things? Is sometimes those are a signpost for like. I'm doing this meditation correctly. You know what I mean? Not to look for it. It just a signpost for you to see, right? And another thing about this tranquility piece is, you know, we talked about it. I read uh, we need both, you know, tranquil mind, which is not just the tranquility. Um, awakening factors, the other collectedness and uh, some other factors has to be in it as well. But this tranquility factor is part of the deal. You know, when the tranquility comes up, your uh, craving went down and then it's giving a more chance for wisdom to develop. But wisdom itself is come from the insights. Okay. Next one is collectedness. Samadhi, right? We know what collectedness is, right? And sometimes it's like, a, to me, this is this is for me, one-pointed concentration, for example, I'm watching a really, really good movie and I am, I forgot all around, like I'm in the theater, I forgot the screen, I forgot the people around me, and I'm just so zoomed into the um, our story. That would be like a you are on totally on the object, right? If you in your meditation you see that it's a little bit back off, because why? Then you don't know it's it's like um, our defilements are coming in or hindrances are visiting you. You don't even know that because you so focus on it, and then what happened is you got a piece and very focused and you know like uh, probably. Are very tranquil and all these things, but when you get out, you you are not learning anything from your own mind, right? And nothing really gained from the practice. So that's that's how for me, you know, I distinguish. And the last one is the equanimity. It's a very beautiful factors of awakening, you know, and uh, the mind is like unshaken unshakably steady you know you are going to be on the objects you can you know and aware that what things happening around you as well right 
and sometimes some people say it's a little bit of like very grounded feeling to it yeah and um, but you know a lot of the time a meditator can be mistaking with the indifference kind of feeling very different and we can talk about it some other times you know the what's a close enemy of loving kindness and what is the close enemy of you know craving and part of it is like this equanimity to you know you feel like the ignoring everything that's not equanimity so how do we use in a um, meditations so you know if you have so much doubt just comes up or, or, or sloth and topper for doubt and sloth and topper you might bring up the investigation factors what, what is it that I'm seeing that's about it like it's not like the full-blown analysis nobody asking you the analytical report you know what I mean just trying to see what am I experiencing this just a little bit can bring you back out of uh, these states or energy just like do I need a little bit more energy you know and if you know how to do uh, bringing up the uh, joy right you can yes did, just to clarify did you say with the investigation one you say it's down or soft and over did you say investigate as to why it's coming up or as to what is coming up what is coming up like what is this you know yeah what is it that I'm noticing right now if you don't remember only one thing to remember wait what am I thinking okay and um, if you are experiencing like aversion or desire like I want to like move or I want to get up right that's the part of the desire desires you know or or like restlessness right bring up a tranquility by relaxing Practice relaxing. Sometimes just sit on the chair and just practice relaxing, right? Uh, and um, equanimity and collectiveness. You know, collectiveness. That's that's those are the one that you might want to bring it up if you are very restless, right? So for me, it's like like relaxing always help. But anyway, a little bit off the track here continue reading when the venerable Nandaka advised the bhikkhuni thus he dismissed them saying go sister it's time then the bhikkhunis having delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Nandaka word rose from their seats and after paying homage to the venerable Nandaka departed keeping him on their right they went to blessed one and after paying homage to him, stood at one side, Blessed One told them, Go, sister, it is time. Then Bhikkhuni paid homage to the Blessed One and departed, keeping him on their right. Soon after they had left, Blessed One addressed the Bhikkhus. Bhikkhus, just as on the Uposoda day of the 14th, people are not doubtful or perplexed as to whether the moon is incomplete or full. Since then, the moon is clearly incomplete. So too, those bhikkhunis are satisfied with Nandaka teaching of the Dharma, but their intention has not been fulfilled. So that day was the 14th day of the month. You know, in the Asian calendar, like as a Burmese, we use these moon calendar, right? Like it's, it's every 15 days, it's a full moon and, you know, moonless day. So this is like a day before do it. That's what it says to me. So Buddha knows that, you know, they are uplifted, joy, but probably some of the excitement in it because they never really um, get this type of question and answer Dharma talk and they got involved in the Dharma. So um, some of them are a little bit needing something. Right. Then Blessed One addressed the Venerable Nandaka. Well then Nandaka, tomorrow Two, you should advise those bhikkhunin in the exactly the same way. Right? Yes, Venerable Sir. 
the Venerable Nandaka replied. Then the next morning, the Venerable Nandaka dressed, you know, repeat the whole thing. And then Bikuni paid homage to the Blessed One and departed, keeping home on their right. So exact same thing happened, exact same discourse, twice. Soon after they had left, Blessed One addressed the Bikus just as on the Uposota day of the 15th, people are not doubtful or perplexed as whether the moon is incomplete or full. Since then, the moon is clearly full. So too, those bhikkhunis are satisfied with Nandaka's teaching of the Dharma and their intention has been fulfilled. Because even the least advance of those 500 bhikkhunis is a stream enterer, no longer subject to perdition, bound, headed, for enlightenment. So this is what Blessed One said and the bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One word. I just want to point it out a, a few important um, for a last little bit of the sections. One is Kristen are bringing up to my attention and thank you. Um, their intention has been fulfilled. So some of the bhikkhunis wants to become an arhant. Some of the bhikkhunis wants to be a once returner, non-returner, you know, sotapanna, whatever their intentions are, fulfilled. That's what is me. So aim high. Or even when you are sitting, you have the, your intention, you have an intention to reach the Nibbana right there. You never know. Okay? So that's one. The second part that I really want to emphasize on listening to the Dhamma talk. Even in a Buddha time, right, these bhikkhunis are practiced already. How important, the importance is emphasize the importance of listening to a Dhamma talk, not just once. Uh, uh, Bhikkhu Nandaka has to do it twice, exact same discourse, right? You don't pick up one, you might pick up another one. So it's uh, really important for me to emphasize that too. And um, Buddha said, we all need we only need, only need two things to enlighten or fully liberate it. One is, um, Delson always say that word, yoni so magnikara, right attention, okay, from your heart, right, right attention. And the second one is um, Pali word called kliana mater, or your Dharma friends. So, that's why we have a group of Dharma friends. You can start one to practice together, discuss the Dharma, not, not a Dharma dispute. I mean, <laughs> Dharma <laughs> discussion. A lot of the time there's a Dharma dispute going on, right? So uh, with that, right, like as another piece of advice I have is, you know, be cautious with the word. Right? The words create a lot of um, concepts in our head. We are learning, these suttas are learning, we are learning from a very old uh, language that they don't even speak today anymore. And some words are speaking, you know, mix it up and things like that. So we have, we can have uh, two problems here. One is loss in translation, right? There's some of them like, I don't like this word, uh, you know, like it has to be that way, right? Probably the truth is it probably above all of the above. So you trying to, don't trying to hold on too tight on, on the word, okay? And um, another one, more important one is loss in interpretation, right? 
So this is where we have to lean on to a many, um, you know, teachers that we have in front of us, you know, um, Bundy has a lot of Dhamma talks, you know, Delson has tons of Dhamma talks, you know, um, and trying to listen, even some other Dhamma talks, and then learn for yourself. This is not my word. This is like Buddha said, experience for yourself. This is, you know, very famous Kalama Sutta said, don't believe because of your ancestor said, don't believe your teacher said it, don't believe because of so-and-so guru said it, don't even believe me. That's what Buddha said. Just come and see for yourself, okay? So that, because sometimes, you know, some of these teachings are teachers, I can only describe what I experience, the way I experience. Even I experience it. I can't fully describe it to you. Think of it as, tell me, what's the difference between smell of a rose and smell of a jasmine? You got my point, right? How do you describe that? Your experience. The jasmine is better. <laughs> <laughs> That's the view. <laughs> Don't hold on to it. Six on it. <laughs> so it's like a very um, important for us to not holding on to anything and see expand it. You know, I can see the progress in this meditation group. Um, people who are light and happy, they got it. Some people hanging on to really dearly, tightly for something. Um, it's a lot of suffering in it, you know? Yep. Another thing I just want, this is just a practical one, that uh, if you guys, um, before you get off from a sitting, I normally do, it's like just sit about one or two minutes and just review your sessions. What goes right? What can I learn from this? <clears throat> and yeah, that's it for me. Open your mind, be happy. See you at Nibbana. <laughs> will, you, will you see us? Maybe. Don't hold on to the views. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let's share merit. Oh, sorry. Is any questions for me? Yes, let's do the questions. Yes. So you and Sutta shared that the Bhikkhunis heard Dhamma and they became enlightened. Yes. Uh, is that something that still happens in today's day and age or is it more ancient times? Well, some people do listening by Dhamma. Uh, at least the first stage of enlightenment, they can happen. But don't forget these you know, uh, you have a, 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 they might have practice in even this lifetime, even with not this, something else, right? And then it's something click, you know. So, but arahantship, I don't know. It's, it can happen by the listening to the Dhamma talk. At, I mean, all days, yes, it's happened, right? But right now is I don't know it can stay happen. Um, our minds uh, stay wired that way because you don't forget we have a lot of distractions, right? Even even for a um, dharma practitioner, you know, like one of the attachment that I have is like the amount of dharma talk I listen to. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I do. I don't do social media. What do I do? I just go and read books and you know, like listen to the dharma talk. That itself is a, a painful. It can be. It can be painful. <laughs> it's an attachment. It's an attachment. You know, recognizing this one. You know, first steps. So working on that. Any question? How, when your mind is very still and there's no distractions coming up. Um, how do you, you know, you're very focused, and 
and then you still have the eye and ear consciousness. How do you make that next leap? You can't. You just have to let that happen. Okay. Yeah. Your may, you think your mind is still enough, but it isn't, obviously. Okay. Otherwise, it will lead you. So just relax at that state. Mm -hmm. You know? That's why, even if you are not meditating, you're just walking around or maybe uh, sitting under the sun, just practice relax. It's, it's, it's come in handy. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Uh, once you attain a certain jhana or level of insight, level of understanding, is it irreversible or can you fall back into a lower state? Of oh, of course you can. <laughs> Jhanas are just for a sitting. Jhanas themselves is impermanence. These are impermanent states. Okay. How about then Nibbana? Nibbana is not. Nibbana is irreplaceable. Like, I mean, irreversible. Because, you know, once you get that wisdom, no way. Okay. Right? All right. When, when cognition stops in C there, eight, um, after the eighth jhana, I mean, a blackout is just absolutely void of anything. There's no time, there's nothing. Most of the people are, um, you know, would say they don't know what happened. Right. So, you know, like, is it? complete blacked out or white out or whatever, you know, they just don't have recall. So it could be a few seconds, it could be a few minutes, who knows, mm -hmm. right? So that's why it is very important that every section, we you look it back, what can I learn from it? How's my session go? What can I do better? What was that I experienced? So you can learn from it. All right, let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisitions of all kinds of happiness. May being inhibiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, everyone.